Okay, welcome to my talk, Uncertainty Quantification in AI. Um, yeah, just as a little extension to this short introduction, um, as I said, mathematical, I'm a mathematician by profession. I really do love mathematical modeling, meaning um, translating some practical problems into the language of mathematics and solving them. I really did like um, the keynote because they also mentioned data science to production, where I'm really also keen on. I think that's uh, one of the main things you want to do if you do data science. You can show only the real benefit of it if you put it into production. I have a little background also in recommender systems where I did some projects. Uh, uncertainty quantification, of course, is one of the things I'm really interested in and that's why I'm here, and also causality, which I think is one of the next hot topics in this world of AI. I'm also a huge fan of the Python data stack, and I have a little open source project myself called PyScaffold, which allows you to set up a standard compliant Python package in a second. So credit where credit is due. Um, the work I'm going to present today is uh, cooperation, actually, and most of it is done by one of my master students, Simon Bachstein. He's now an esteemed colleague of mine at Innovex, and he did his master thesis around this topic. So if uh, I'm going to share the slides later. You can follow me just on Twitter or get it over the website, I hope. And um, there you also get all the URLs, so if you want to dig even deeper into this topic, you will find uh, then the master thesis and also some, some more blog posts about this topic. So what are we going to cover today? Um, first of all, I'm give you a short introduction on what uns uncertainty quantification actually is, why you should um, be careful about it, why it is important in many use cases. Then um, I'll give you um, uh, introduction to several methods, how to accomplish actually uncertainty quantification. And um, it's going to be uh, like an intuitive introduction. So I'm going to just like cover um, um, yeah, the, the some parts of it. And in the end, um, I'm going to show you how we evaluated all those different methods to then give you an overview uh, kind of a qualitative um, comparison of those different methods and when you should rather pick one of those or the other. And this will be also the conclusion and an outlook what's going to come next. So you might think if you have read the abstract or something, you might say, okay, uncertainty quantification, isn't this something we do all the time, right? So how many of you um, have a background or are using deep learning or have ever used deep learning models? Maybe just raise your hands. Okay, some of them. So one of the standard examples is that you have some, um, some convolutional neural network, you put in some pictures, and in the end you have some softmax layer that tells you the, the probability that the picture you're giving it is either a cat, a dog, a hot dog, or whatever. And in this case, uh, yeah, we see, uh, we see clearly uh, it's a cat, and the network tells us, yeah, well, it's 90% a cat. And you could say, well, this is already like some uncertainty quantification. Is it not? And um, for other, like, animals, uh, this is clearly a dog for us humans, and there it's not so sure. So why is this not enough? And the thing is, it is enough if you just put in the, the samples you used during the training or something that is similar to your samples in the training. But what happens if we put something in which was never seen before, which is completely different? You put in a picture of a bird and the neural network you trained perfectly uh, for the classification of cats and dogs, they will give you any number. So you would might you would expect it to be like like 50% cat, 50% dog to kind of tell you I'm not certain what it is, but practically it could even tell you 90% dog or 90% cat. So it's you can end up anywhere. And this is actually like the, the, the real problem. So this neural network has no way of telling you I've never seen anything like this before. I'm not just give you an output, but I'm going to also tell you that I'm really, really uncertain of the output I'm giving you. And this is something you might not care about if you're doing this just for um, classifying cats and dogs, but it, what is really important if you have any, uh, any problem, for instance, in autonomous driving or 
in, in medical uh, use cases where it's really important to know how certain um, the network is. And to give you a little intuition why it might be that you get here 90% cat, although it's a, it's a bird, um, I've actually um, um, attended to a really cool conference beginning of the year where uh, there was a paper about the problem and they had a really nice intuitive explanation. So um, neural networks or so deep neural networks work in the way that they find some, some, some internal representation of all the samples you put in. In this case, uh, the samples are the little dots and we have now four classes, no, so not two, so this uh, green, red and so on classes. And with this, within this like internal representation state, the dense layers, all they do is they find some decision boundaries, some really simple decision boundaries. I mean, deep learning is just some kind of automated feature engineering in many cases. And um, the thing about those decision boundaries is that they go to infinity in each direction. So that means if you would now put in an, a new sample of a bird, for instance, then the neural network finds this internal representation and it might happen, happen since a bird is nowhere close to anything the network has ever seen before, that you end up with your example somewhere here and the network is going to tell you, well, I'm really, really sure that it is, is in this class, although um, it should rather tell you that, yeah, you are way away from what you've seen before. So this is like the intuition why something like this may happen. But um, this is all about classification. It's actually even worse with uh, regression problems, right? If we do a simple regression problem, so these are the observation data, are those crosses, and now we fitted um, this uh, observations with some neural network. Um, I think it was two layers deep and ReLU activations and so on. And you would say by just looking at this, well, this looks quite good, doesn't it? So we have a nice fit and we might be happy. But looking again at it, we see that there seems to be some, some noise in our data, right? You see the crosses here and there, and there seem, seems to be some intrinsic noise in our data, and the network just tells us nothing about this noise. It just gives us some output, some, some Y value for each X, and we don't know that actually, well, it might be this, but it might also be a little bit above here and so on, and this might be interesting in, in, in many use cases. Actually, um, even worse is the thing, so we trained um, the, the network on the domain of 0 to 10 and now what happens with extrapolation? If you ask the network, please extrapolate, then here from 10 to 20, then it will give you some line and um, this line looks quite linear. Um, this is due to the fact that we used uh, ReLU activations, but it's just going to give you this line and you don't know that this is just something, it might be anything at this point, and it's just giving you some output without telling you, well, this is not a domain you trained on, and this looks simple in 1D, but uh, might be extremely difficult in, in multi-dimensional spaces where you don't know how your domain actually looks like. So, um, showing you the true um, function, we see that it's completely off, which is fine. Uh, so, it's completely off outside the training domain, which is fine. I mean, how would it know? And it fitted quite well um, within the domain. What we actually would want to see and what the actual the, the goal of this whole uncertainty quantification is and, and what the goal of the rest of my talk is, is to show you methods which tell you about the uncertainty in, re, uh, in, in regression problems. So that means you have these shadings giving you some, some confidence interval and telling you that even um, at uh, the domain from 0 to 10, um, there is a certain uncertainty. So there is uncertainty um, uh, within the data. And as we move away from, um, from our um, domain of samples, the uncertainty should grow. And I mean, if you had a result like this, you could really argue that, well, I would not trust this result at all at that point because... So that's the goal. 
And so far we have talked about uncertainty and there are actually two kinds of uncertainty. So there's the, the aleatoric uncertainty. So this is the intrinsic uncertainty in our data. So this uh, might be due to the fact how we measure the data and this might be due to the fact that we are missing some, some features. Like um, there was also a good example uh, in the keynote today that if you have uh, house prices and you want to predict the house prices and the only feature variable you have are the amount of square meters uh, the apartment has, then you can make some prediction but you will have some some noise because you're missing some features and getting more of the same data will not decrease this noise. You need other data, additional data. But um, yeah, in many cases you will always have some aleatoric noise because you cannot measure uh, everything. And um, besides aleatoric noise, you also have the epistemic noise. And this is the noise um, due to the lack of, of data, to the lack of uh, uh, of what you know, the lack of knowledge about uh, the underlying process about the model. And this uh, uncertainty you can, um, you can decrease by just collecting more data in this domain. And um, it's, it's quite good many times to, to differentiate between those because then you could, for instance, say if you have, um, yeah, if you um, are about to collect more data and if collecting data costs money you could say okay let's invest more to collect more data here than in these cases where more data gets us nothing or you could argue that you need other features. So far about the motivation now I'm going to present several methods um, on how to achieve this and during our journey I will start with something quite um, uh, mathematical uh, with a lot of mathematical assumptions and we go on and, rel and relax on those assumptions as we proceed and um, then they become much and more uh, more and more um, like deep learning based. So Gaussian processes. So this is a really a uh, topic you could give so I'm just going to give you the intuition. So normally if you have a random variable and you, you pull one sample from this ra random variable, you have uh, like a scalar or vector of numbers. A Gaussian process is different. It's if you pull one sample, you have a whole function. So you have something like a lot of random functions have one instance of a function and a function has an infinite number of points right so for each x you could ask your function give me give me some y value and um, how does a Gaussian process do this it's, it's a stochastic process and um, it's actually also the definition of a Gaussian process that if you ask for a finite collection of data points so if you have a finite number of those x values then um, it actually behaves like a multivariate normal distribution. And in practice, we're going to deal only with a, with a uh, finite number of points, and so this works for us. But because we, you could ask for any kind of points, um, we have here a mean, uh, a mean function and a correlation function, and not what you have in a normal distribution where you would have your mean vector and your covariance um, matrix but I mean as you input you could imagine it like a growing vector and a growing covariance help of you could um, you could encode um, or you could tell this Gaussian process some prior information you might have that your function has a trend or that it's a constant functions and so on. But more interesting is actually the covariance function where you can uh, tell it how the function should look like. Is it a really smooth function or is it something a little jacked or so on? And uh, the basic idea is that x values are close to each other then also the y values should be strongly correlated and as you move away the correlation should be um, not as high so that you have more way of like more spread. So this is uh, quite abstract but it's really easy if you just see it so let's take as an example this exponential quadratic um, covariance function and um, the mean function of uh, zero 
And uh, you also see here if uh, two points are really close to each other, then uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, high cov covariance. And um, here you would see this um, uh, Gaussian process and all those colored lines are just random samples from this two functions. So all of this is just one sample from a, from a Gaussian process. And on the right side, we see something where we put a trend and um, this is yeah, the way how we uh, Gaussian process is defined and what you could tune, like you could put in all the prior information, the prior knowledge you have about some, some use case. And so far, we have not seen any data. So this was just a definition and you, the prior knowledge you put in there. So how does inference work? So let's say we have some data. We know a little bit how our function looks like. And um, let's say we have those three data points. We have uh, two at minus two and five at one and so on. And now we update this Gaussian process. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of math and uh, uses many facts of uh, the multivariate normal distribution that you can condition uh, on them and that it still be, uh, is a uh, normal distribution and so on. So, but the result is quite intuitive, like you would expect. So, um, the, the, the posterior will look like this. So the, the dashed line is actually the, the mean and it goes through those values because we know how the function looks like at those points and still the uncertainty is quite high in the middle between two points. And the colored lines again are like random samples, how they could behave. And um, this is actually how you can then yeah, quantify your, your uncertainty. So at each point, you could give a confidence interval that, uh, that values that the function is within this. Practically, we never do interpolation, right? Um, because we think that our observations also have some, some uncertainty, some aleatoric uncertainty, for instance. So you can also um, do inference with noisy observations. And then you see that even at those points, the noise goes down, the uncertainty, uh, sorry, the uncertainty goes down. Here we put much more weight, so the uncertainty is much smaller because those points stands actually for five points. And here it's only one. And um, this is basically the 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 idea behind uh, Gaussian processes. So to wrap this up, um, I just put here the some formula how you would calculate this. But actually, what the only thing that is interesting for if you like have a software engineering background and if you think okay, let's program this, is that you have. Um, that you have this matrix in inversion in there. And I should again state what, what X is. X is the data you have, and uh, X star would be the data points you want to evaluate your function, so uh, during a prediction and so on. And you see that the inversion of a matrix is, is computationally really intensive. It's uh, in the complexity of cubic N. So as you have more and more data points, let's say 100,000, 1 million data points, then this becomes incredibly hard to actually compute. And this is one of the reasons that Gaussian processes, at least this classical variant, are not really capable of dealing with uh, big data problems. Although nowadays you have sparse um, Gaussian processes and so on. So people are working on this um, because of the nice property of Gaussian processes. And if you have, uh, if you're interested in this, um, I can really recommend uh, some tutorials by Christopher Fonsbeck, who uh, has a lot of material about Gaussian processes. So this is like something, it was something really mathy, and we use this Gaussian processes as a baseline now to compare um, other methods which are like more in the realm of AI or actually, uh, I would say, deep learning. Um, the next method is called Monte Carlo dropout. And um, the idea is that you use the dropout um, method that you normally use during training. So that means that if you train a neural network, you randomly activate and deactivate several nodes. And this helps um, in, in many cases to regularize your weights. So intuitively, it spreads the knowledge over the whole network and not 
just on some local uh, parts of the neural network. And this is a method that is quite often used um, in, in all kinds of uh, deep learning architectures. And the idea of this paper actually dropout as a Bayesian approximation if said, okay, if we use dropout during training, and normally you don't use it then during prediction, why not use it also during prediction? So that means if you put in one value and if you um, then change your, your dropout, you get different Y values. And those different Y values you could then uh, just assume this is some kind of some kind of distribution I'm sampling from, so it means you can calculate uh, the mean and the standard deviation and just treat this as some some uncertainty. And this is the whole concept of this paper. It's really interesting um, because they also have like uh, they state a lot of theoretical um, characteristics of this um, of this method and also make a link to some kind of stacked uh, Gaussian processes so it's really interesting so this we implemented and um, as another method um, to achieve uncertainty quantification um, we implemented the deep ensembles so there the basic idea is that you use um, a neural network and instead of just outputting one value you want to output a whole distribution and you can output a whole distribution by using some, some parameterized distribution like the normal distribution and outputting just the, the parameters of this distribution. So now you think, okay, how can I, if I just have X and Y values, how can I actually fit this? And the thing is, um, you can um, just do a little math and come up with some custom loss function. So if you take a normal distribution, calculate the negative log likelihood, you uh, will end up having this uh, custom loss function. And you see that it's still some kind of root mean squared error or a mean squared error. And um, it's kind of weighted by the, by the uh, variance here. And um, at the same time, the variance is tried to keep, to be kept quite small. So those two terms are kind of fighting against each other in a, um, yeah, um, speaking intuitively. And um, so you could, uh, yeah, get a, get a feeling for it, why this kind of works, why um, the network really needs to find the, r r uh, the right parameters, mean and uh, the, the variance. Um, this is called deep ensemble, so this was one network, and now assume we have lots of them. So we have a lot of networks that give us different, um, different means and different uh, variances or standard deviations, and we just average them now to, in to decrease kind of the variance of this, because each network we're gonna uh, train with the same data or with the bootstrap data might end up in uh, different of those and this is how we can um, kind of decrease um, the, the, the variance in them uh, in that we calculate those uh, averages. And um, those you basically then, then uh, use. Um, when we... so. One of the problems, of course, here is that if you have a lot of neural networks, you have a lot of computation to do, and um, that also means that you, you have to afford uh, the hardware. Um, so what uh, Simon and I thought, okay, why not combine the best of two worlds, as we thought? Why not take the idea of Monte Carlo dropouts and deep ensembles and come up with uh, dropout ensembles in the way that we use a network of um, the network of the deep ensembles, a single one, and instead of having now an ensemble of it, we just apply a dropout and treat each of those dropout configuration as one um, different network. And then we can also calculate those, um, those averaged uh, means and, and standard deviations. Another really, really simple method is uh, quantile regression, and you can also apply it to uh, neural networks. So, um, 
what is uh, um, quantile regression, maybe a little recap, what is the cumulative distribution function. So it's just uh, so given some, some, some point, some, some y, it's just a probability of values uh, below equal y showing up and this gives you this, this probability. And uh, um, the quantile function is just the inverse of it. So um, if you are able to calculate this, of course, you have the whole knowledge about the distribution, and then you can uh, define confidence intervals and whatever you want. So if we are able to achieve this, we are also able to, to quantify um, the uncertainty. This might look like a little bit complicated. How can you actually get a neural network to give you this uh, informum of all y's and so on? But actually, it's quite easy. It's again the trick that you have a special loss function and uh, you can estimate the quantiles with this loss functions. So the difference uh, to some, some root mean squared error um, is that you, first of all, you have two different losses depending on if you have a left or right hand side error, if you are below, if your estimation is below or above um, the actual value, and um, it's, uh, it's not the, the L2 norm, it's the L1 norm, so you have uh, the, the absolute value. And depending on what uh, percentile tau you pick, you kind of weight those two errors. This might also sound quite uh, abstract, but again, it's actually quite easy. So let's assume we have tau uh, 0.5. So if you're looking for the median, then uh, this becomes actually uh, 0.5 and 0.5. So it's, it's equal. And then you can see how it works in a simple example. Let's say we want to find the medium, uh, uh, median of, um, of those four points and we assume that the median is here, which is uh, wrong. Um, we can just calculate um, the, the errors and uh, it's only right-hand side errors um, because we are our prediction is uh, smaller. We sum it up. Now we would do some prep propagation or, or something and an and update step and we decreased now our loss by four times 0.1 and um, we are still not at the minimum so you would do it maybe again and you see that now you gained so if we go back and forth we decreased by 0.3 and increased now the the left hand error and um, now we are at the minimum so you get the feeling that if you move um, all, all kind of errors are, are treated the same. So the distance, the actual distance plays no role um, in, this, um, in this metric. And if you would now go on a little bit further, so I'm just switching back and forth, you see that you are now at this tipping point. So going one step to the right gets you um, two times 0 0.1 as a left, uh, left hand side error and this is decreased on the right hand side so you're now uh, at this optimum so what it just does is it makes sure that they're that they're the same number of points to the left as they are to the right with this uh, uh, loss function how does it now work with um, with for instance the 75 percent percentile so um, there um, we have now this tau, uh, 1 minus tau and tau, and this results then in the fact that now the, the right-hand side error is three times as much as the left-hand side error. So it's, it's just a different weighting. And this means that this, um, this uh, point is, is wrong because those two errors now weigh three times as much. So we have to step further to the right so that this one error um, is like, uh, yeah, it has the same weight as those three errors. And this is exactly done with the help of this weighting. So I think this, uh, I hope this gets you a little intuition uh, of how this uh, custom loss function work. And I always think it's a good idea if someone gives you some, some formula and just says, okay, apply this loss function and it will work that one really understands what, what is going on. So much about um, the quantile regression. 
And now we said, um, okay, let's uh, let's let's really um, evaluate those different methods, those five different methods. So we took um, the function you already saw in the in the motivation. So this is function we grabbed from some uh, PhD thesis of Yari and Gall, and uh, we chose again the the domain zero to ten. We sampled. We took. Uh, um, uh, we added some noise um, to the data with 0 0.5 standard deviation and now yeah, tried those different methods. So to give you again a picture how this looks, um, this is uh, the, the observations and the, the, the true function in a way and this is the five sigma uh, interval um, of how the uh, data is spread due to the noise. So for our experiments, um, we used um, then for the neural networks two hidden layers with uh, 20 ReLU uh, neurons. We took uh, only five uh, deep for the deep ensembles, just to keep the computation a little bit down. For the dropout predictions, as I said, for each X value, you need to generate more or many uh, Y values, we so we chose uh, 100. Um, Adam optimizer batch size of 128 and for each of the methods we optimized um, the learning rate, weight decay and also the dropout prob probabilities to really make it a fair comparison by yeah, optimizing those hyperparameters for each uh, method individually. And for the Gaussian processes, I mean there we don't really train. Um, we chose the squared exponential covariance and zero mean function, what you saw in the introduction of the Gaussian processes and um, the covariance function parameters were trained on the aleatoric uh, noise. For um, the comparison um, and for the results we chose different methods. So first of all uh, normal mean squared error as um, yeah because just a common, a common uh, way um, and this for the, um, the, the mean and the standard deviation. We also took the mean negative log likelihood because this is uh, one of the loss function that is also directly optimized, for instance, in the deep ensembles, and also the mean kullback uh, leibler divergence, just to have different met metrics where we can see how good our results are. And um, these are just some of the results of our uh, experiments for the, for the interpolation. So now, how good is it to, to actually fit between 0 and 10 our function? We see that um, um, according to the mean uh, negative log likelihood, it's uh, kind of similar for all of them. Um, for the mean squared error uh, with respect to the mean, we see that the Gaussian processes are really doing a good job. I mean, this is kind of where they excel due to the fact that, I mean, they also have uh, this is mathematical assumption of normal distribution in it. So it's, uh, it's really um, where they can shine. You also see it um, with respect to the standard deviation and also to the mean kullback like -like divergence. Of all the more like um, deep learning based methods, we see that the deep ensembles are also um, yeah, are also giving us quite good uh, results. Now, the other question was, I mean, there was this thing with the aleatoric noise, so what happens during the, the interpolation, but we were also interested in, in the extrapolation, right? So how does this look like? So we see here the Monte Carlo dropout, and we see, okay, here interpolation looks good, but extrapolation it does not seem to capture the fact that it should become uncertain much, much faster. And, and um, it's like just visually, it does not look like we, 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 we actually hope for. So f if you ask yourself why you have this checked line, so this is due to the, to the sampling and uh, to, the, to the noise. Um, for the deep ensembles, this looks much better. So at least on the right hand side uh, or, the, or the right side, um, this looks good, so it realizes that as, as it goes away from the, from the sample domain, the uncertainty uh, increases more and more. On the left side, it's maybe due to the fact that it's like this narrow uh, slide here, um, it 
does not really get the fact that um, yeah that the uncertainty should be, should be much higher. So dropout ensembles. Um, so this was uh, this combination of Monte Carlo dropout and deep ensembles. It looks kind of similar to uh, Monte Carlo dropout, and this is what the the quantile regression gets us. So it's even worse at this left side. How, on the other hand, Gaussian processes look like? So they actually give us kind of the results that we would intuitively expect. And this is always good to see as a mathematician that the most mathematical methods uh, actually works the best. Um, there you see that if you go away, the uncertainty goes up and we are going back to our prior knowledge. So, um, I mean, this is how we designed the Gaussian process, but this is actually also something you would want to see, right? I mean, if you move away into this region, and um, the result uh, you're going to get there, um, you clearly want to have a strong indication that um, the result you get there is uh, like, like extremely uncertain. We also checked about the convergence. I mean, this is uh, always interesting if you are caring about the data efficiency. So depending on how much data you have, how um, fast do the, the results converge. And um, of course, we see um, due to the definition of the Gaussian processes, it can already work with little data. Actually, it gets complicated if you have too much data. So it's really fast at a really good, um, uh, has a really good quality really fast with, a, with not much uh, training samples. On the other hand, um, methods like uh, quantile regression and uh, deep ensembles, so those, those are two, these two lines, they um, are, as you get more and more data in, they're getting better and better. And uh, what was quite of uh, fascinating for us that the dropout based methods, they seem to kind of level out to saturate. And this um, we uh, thought or still think this is due to the fact how this dropout mechanism works, that even is, as you pour in more and more data, you kind of your quality levels out. You're so you, you seem to not get better than a certain uh, level. Um, we also tried a lot of other experiments, so heteroscedastic noise, so what happens if the noise is, is different uh, throughout the function. And here, um, Gaussian processes are actually really bad, which is, um, yeah, they just assume uh, homoscedastic noise. Uh, deep ensembles uh, did quite well, and also quantile regression could handle quite good, because quantile regression also, they don't have any strong assumptions about uh, the the about the underlying distribution. <coughs> and uh, we also tried non-Gaussian noise. I think this was an exponential uh, distribution. There still, uh, although Gaussian processes have the, the assumption it worked quite of, normal of a normal distribution, it, quite, uh, it worked quite well. Uh, quantile regression had a little problem to kind of, I guess, with the outliers to really uh, fit here uh, well. And um, the other thing was what I mentioned in the motivation is that sometimes for some use cases it's really good to have a split between uh, this aleatoric and this epistemic noise. And the cool thing about the deep ensembles is that you can actually now split up this function, how you, um, how you, uh, the how you combine the different uh, variances into two terms and treat one as an aleatoric noise and the other one as the epistemic noise. So, um, and this gives you then the possibility to is really nice, so th that I explained before. So we see that here in our training interval, in our training domain of 0 and 10, we have aleatoric noise and the, the, the red one the epistemic noise is really, really small. So here, this method would really tell us if you get any more of the same data, it will not help you at all. Either get other features, but not more of the same data. And here we see that the, the epistemic noise is increasing. And this would tell us, okay, let's get more data for, those, uh, for this region. And uh, so this is a really uh, benefit of those um, ensemble methods that you can do this nice split. 
So to give you a summary at this point, um, this is like a qualitative, qualitative uh, summarization of the different methods, maybe so when rather to use which method or uh, the other. So if you have or assume homoscedastic noise uh, in, your, in your data and if you maybe have not that much data, um, then definitely Gaussian processes, there are many packages for, doing th uh, for using them. I would definitely use them because they have a really good uh, accuracy. Um, also, the data efficiency was really good. Speed really depends. So classical um, Gaussian processes only for, for small data to medium-sized data. Um, but as I said, there's also extensions that work with uh, sparse approximations and so on. And you also have this uncertainty split that I just showed. The uh, Monte Carlo uh, dropout methods actually uh, was not, our the results did not was kind of uh, okay. You don't have this uncertainty split. It was still quite uh, fast. And um, and we saw this problem with the with the convergence. Um, the deep ensembles um, they worked. I would say they were definitely the the best method. If you wanna, if you need some 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 deep learning approach, you have this nice uncertainty split. They could also handle heteroscedastic noise really well. Dropout method. So our own method is somewhere in between Monte Carlo dropout and deep ensemble, but with the advantage that it's not as computationally expensive but has the uncertainty split and a really really simple method actually is this quantile regression because this you could implement yourself really fast because it's just like um, yeah like changing this this loss function and uh, if you want to start with something deep learning based and um, yeah, something easy, then um, I would actually go for this. So it really depends on the use case. But uh, as it was also said in the, in the keynote, start definitely with something uh, simple whenever you do, um, like if you're just about to dive in a, in a new use case. Okay, to, to sum this up um, and to co conclude the talk, um, we showed that um, all the approaches here, they are certainly aware of the aleatoric uncertainty, but they are not really capable of estimating the epistemic uncertainty. So only the really mathematical method, the Gaussian processes, they gave us a clear signal about the ignorance. And what would be really cool is to have a combined solution um, because we see in more and more practical use cases coming up that people really start to care about uncertainty estimation. Uh, so, and, and I really do believe uh, we, we need to also raise the awareness that uh, we should not just trust some machine learning model that gives us some output, some single number, some point estimator, but that we should always ask for um, how certain is actually what you're giving me. And there are other approaches we had no time to really uh, look into. Um, maybe we'll, we'll do this then um, in, a, in a kind of new iteration of this uh, evaluation. Um, there are also Bayesian neural networks. So there the difference is that instead of having it's just weights, just scalars, uh, you have whole distributions. Then there are the uh, sparse, Gaussian pro uh, sparse Gaussian process approximations that I mentioned before, there the basic idea is instead of taking all your data points, you kind of find clusters and, and special points where you then uh, give a weight to them and so on. So you're kind of decreasing the data you're actually dealing with. And there's even things like Gaussian process on top of neural ne networks, uh, which are even more fancy. And uh, the idea is to also incorporate them in, a, in the next iteration. So far, thanks a lot for uh, your attention. I hope um, yeah, I uh, helped you to understand uncertainty quantification, also to raise the awareness of it. And yeah, I'm open for questions. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>